All right, welcome and thanks so much to Hashtag Sports for having us all a part of this panel. This one, of course, is called how, we were to say how COVID, but how 2020 really has hit the reset button on society and what it means for marketing. My name is David Brickley. I'm the owner and CEO of STN Digital. We're a social first marketing agency. And I brought two of my uh, great friends and colleagues in the space. Um, she's the, the VP of Mountain Dew and PepsiCo, Nicole Portwood, and also um, the co-founder of Poppy Creative, Lori Hall. So I'm going to throw it to you, Nicole, and you can do a much better job than me to, to give the fine folks a little bit of uh, your roles, responsibilities, and, and what your expertise is. Sure. Um, thank you for the intro, and thanks so much for having me here. I'm so excited for this conversation. So much is happening in this year, um, yeah. and I, we could talk for hours about it, but um, we'll try and make it a fun half hour. Um, so yeah, I'm the VP of Mountain Dew at PepsiCo. I run everything having to do with the business, so uh, innovation, advertising, PR, social, creative, commercialization, programming, partnerships, all that great stuff. Um, I have an awesome, awesome team. Uh, prior to that, I was the CMO at Tito's, the vodka company down in Austin for about nine years. And that was really where I kind of honed in on this fan centric um, model for marketing. And so that's, that's kind of where I put most of my energies on a day-to-day -day basis is this idea of how we connect with our fandom and how we continue to show them the love that they show us every time they take out their money and buy some Mountain Dew. So yeah. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Lori, take us away. Yes. Hi, I'm Lori Hall, co-founder of Pop and Creative. We are a multicultural marketing agency and we launched earlier this year. Um, my previous life, I was the SVP of marketing for TV One, a, a African-American targeted television network. Uh, and before that, I was at UpTV as VP marketing and at Turner Broadcasting, TBS, TNT, TCM for several years where I launched everything from all of uh, Tyler Perry's TV shows when he first came to TV, uh, all the way up into Sex and Sex and City, Cougar Town, and many more. So I've had a long career in marketing, and a little known fact is I was actually um, on, working on Being Bobby Brown when that show hit. So that was a fun one, a little fun awesome. fact. <laughs> and has survived and launched a company during 2020. If that's not the biggest uh, staple of your career, I don't know what is. So congrats <laughs> to everything you. that you're doing. I don't know what I was thinking. <laughs> That's a yeah. mic drop moment, Lori. Yeah, exactly. right. Right. There we go. Um, I, I started a business during a global pandemic. Thank you very much. So, <laughs> right. um, so we've all talked about this like uh, off, you know, the panel, and I'm excited to dig more into it. And and, and you may, maybe some of your opinions have changed because I think it changes every every week or so. But yeah. what I keep on saying about what's happening in 2020 is what I don't hear a lot of marketers talk about is the population really has been educated at scale because of the pandemic, where we talk about mm -hmm. virtual events and more virtual meetings. And that affects not only, you know, business and your ability to meet with more people, events, but also revenue streams and business overall. So we'd love to hear from uh, Lori to start things off, how you think we've kind of been thrown into this thing that was obviously, it's, it's been so unfortunate. We've lost so many lives, but mm -hmm. in this in this kind of new world of 2020, you know, it's really changed marketing uh, for the future. Yes, it, it, you know, nobody could have predicted it, obviously. I don't think a lot of businesses were ready. Uh, what's interesting is we've had uh, tools, you know, digital virtual tools at our disposal for a while, but we didn't rely on them so heavily because I think we've always had, especially in corporate America, um, a traditional notion of being in the office, seeing people, meeting people, flying out for meetings, et cetera. Um, and the pandemic forced everyone to really get on the bandwagon of doing everything virtually. Um, so businesses have had to pivot and we could have done it a lot sooner, but now it's a necessity. It's mission critical. You will not survive unless you have figured out how to streamline and, and make everything virtual that you can, um, because we don't know where this pandemic is going even to today. So I think the marketers that are doing it best are the marketers that were always pro digital, pro social. Um, for those who were not, I feel like they're trying to play catch up in a significant way. And um, I think it's going to end up making all of us better because we're going to be able to use these tools, you know, at our disposal a little bit more. But I am um, excited about where we can go despite the tragedy in the world right now, because I do think that despite, you know, everything that's going on, tragedy can kind of create a bit more innovation for us. Yeah. And Nicole, specifically with, you know, Mountain Dew and PepsiCo, obviously, highly, highly rely on out of home, traditional marketing in arena yeah. signage with all your different sports partnerships. And all of a sudden overnight, that is no longer a lever you can pull. So super interested for you to break down kind of how that's changed your guys' philosophy internally. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the biggest uh, headlines I can say is I don't think anybody's really cracked it quite yet. 
um, one yeah. of the things that is so compelling about those live experiences is this shared human experience that we have when you're in an arena and you're standing up and cheering all together and you feel that real emotional impact of what it's like to have a collective experience. And, you know, I think a lot of folks have made great strides in that. I want to applaud the NBA, who's a partner of ours, and what they've done to really trailblaze the fan experience um, in that sport. But, you know, one of the things we can't replace is the sort of, you know, limbic system reaction that we have from sharing experiences with other people. And the closest we've gotten so far, are some of these real digital native experiences, things that were built in the digital world in the first place and designed mm -hmm. to elicit those emotional and physical responses from the beginning. I think the gaming space is is that, right? It was built in a virtual world from day one and is probably, you know, 10 years ahead of most other industries when it comes to mm -hmm. having those kind of real engaging, uh, engaging fan experiences. But the, the, I think the biggest shift for us as marketers is this having to understand that now that everyone has really acclimated to a virtual life, people are demanding more from those virtual experiences. Yeah. It's no longer okay to just kind of tick the box and do a couple things here and there. And to your point, Lori, like some folks are way ahead of others. Yeah. If you've prioritized digital experience, if you've prioritized having a point of view and a voice in the social mm -hmm. space, then you're probably a little bit further along and others may be kind of scrambling to figure out how to do that, whether through e-commerce or just kind of pri prioritizing how they show up in those channels. Yeah, and I think the one thing that really interests me is, if, again, the educating the population at scale. You're talking about 87 year olds that are logging into Zoom now to hang out with yeah. their grandkids. <laughs> totally. So now we now we know as marketers from the age of I don't know eight years old or maybe even younger to 95 years old, we probably have to understand they probably know how to enter a virtual meeting or a virtual space. Yeah. And I think for marketers that's yeah. so important because hashtag sports. They'll continue to have their amazing conference in New York. We'll get together. We'll share cocktails. But why can't Hashtag Sports have this same virtual event once a month? And you can be a subscriber and you can get this yeah. amazing you know, content. Mm -hmm. That starts to add new you know, revenue streams that were never there before that I think changes a lot of ways uh, companies can, can uh, capitalize on that. I think there's a cost implication there too, just, and I know this is not an yeah. original idea, but on the idea of, um, of business travel and yeah. we need That's to huge. show up for each other, right? Like so much of business is relationship yeah. building and being present with each other. And we've seemed to create proxies for that with like our kids coming in the room or our cats yeah. walking across the yeah. desk. You're human. Your coworkers, your yeah. coworkers. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. you're, you're human. And that's yeah. like, there are new virtual ways to build those connections, but yes. yeah, it'll definitely have an implication. And I think that it's also increased accessibility. People that, you know, you might not have been able to get for a conference before yeah. or get to do some kind of spotlight, you know, virtually, um, you're able to get access to them. Um, I was recently yeah. a part of putting on a conference for a client and they were able to get some of the top CEOs in the world to join because they could join from their living rooms. Yeah. So I feel like accessibility has been a really interesting thing, um, not just corporately, but also in terms of fandom, like the accessibility people have to talent because, you know, they're just like us as they say in you know <laughs> the magazines right. they're just yeah. like us um the talent and celebrities have missed that fan interaction as well just as much as we've missed yeah. seeing them in yeah. our favorite places so um being able to see you know lebron at home or being able to see yeah. you know your favorite um star at home has been a, a novelty and i think it's really opened up you know a lot more fandom and a lot more uh intimacy with celebrities yeah. and real people yeah and I'll, and I'll admit i uh i bought some stock in live nation not because it's going good now but i'm just convinced once things open <laughs> Back up. Let me buy some. <laughs> <laughs> Once things open back up, I think all three of us will probably be like, I want to get out to a concert. I want to get out to a yep. Laker game and all those it things are going to happen eventually. Yeah. The novelty, yep. but I think humans like to be around humans. That's why you pay $17 for a cocktail to hang out with other humans. I think it's going to happen <laughs> at your house. But I think the point is when things get back to quote unquote normal, we now have this whole additional, I think, lever that we can pull, right? Mm. Um, both on the business side good point. and also on the marketing side. I want to get your bo both your thoughts because you both worked in corporate America at really large companies. Um, really how 2020 has changed the way, and Nicole, you and I talked about this a lot, how large corporations can now pivot on a dime, which before, mm -hmm. you know, you change the color on a bottle, you're talking about nine levels of approval and, you know, 27 different meetings. But with the Black Lives Matter movement, with COVID, I mean, supply chain issues that you guys ran into back in March and April, I mean, you had to make decisions within hours. 
Yeah, that is very, very true. And I think there are a couple of things that go into that capability that, you know, again, to reiterate all of the tragedy and the difficulty that's come out of this, there are some hard lessons learned that I think we all hope will carry forward, um, no matter what happens in the world. Uh, and that, that ability to find agility within even yeah. a very matrixed and corporate structure, I think it was novel and was surprising to everyone. Um, how able we were to make those kind of pivots. Now, I can't say that I've been able to accelerate the timelines and changing the color of a bottle. That still takes a really <laughs> long time. But um, so the, I think there, there are a couple things. One is transparency and this real willingness to, to come with challenges that you want to collaborate to solve rather than having to figure out everything on your own and then come to the table or yeah. to executive mm -hmm. leadership with those answers. It's like, these are the things happening now. Let's get together and solve those problems and then move forward. Do it as a group, do it however collaboratively we need to, to get those things answered and move. Um, and then the other is, I think, visionary leadership. I really, mm -hmm. really believe that has a lot to do with the ability to pivot and make moves when you have someone um, like Roman LaGuarta, who is our global CEO, who has a very clear vision for things around equality and social justice, for uh, uh, investing in the black community, for investing in the Hispanic community, things mm -hmm. we're going to do internally and externally. Mm -hmm. And so being able to, I think, kind of fearlessly make some of those statements from the highest level of the company gives the freedom and the trust and the courage for the rest of the organization to move quickly against those things as well. Yeah, and, and Lori, working at TV One and Turner and, and, and those different larger organizations, I'm just wondering if the, the, the executives knowing that, oh my goodness, we made a decision in 24 hours and actually made progress on this, does that change, do you think, um, I guess just not COVID or, or Black Lives Matter moments, but just your average corporate moments, does that now kind of say, ah, we can do this? Yeah, I think it's a little bit of what Nicole said, you know, uh, people are, are willing to talk about problem solving in the moment versus you having to have it figured out and that yeah. accessibility to the executives, um, you know, the CEO, whomever else you need to talk to has had that time is shortened. And I think that's really important. At the beginning of COVID, I don't know about you guys, but uh, when I was in corporate America, uh, when it first hit, it you know we had meetings upon meetings upon meetings. I felt like the meetings just increased because everybody wanted to make sure that things were moving forward. Everyone wanted to make sure that nothing would be dropped given that everybody had to be home. Um, but what that did was it made the approvals faster, like you said. Yeah. Um, it taught us that we could actually be agile, you know, as Nicole mentioned. Um, and I think that's continued. And I think that that's a good thing. You know, the hierarchy, you know, for a small business owner now, you know, my, my hierarchy is pretty flattened, <laughs> you know, but <laughs> we just have to get things done, yeah. which is great. Uh, but I think that sometimes hierarchy can, you know, just be such a challenge, you know, sometimes when it doesn't need to be. I understand right. the layers of approvals yeah. when there's something significant about the brand, like a bottle color change, who knows. Right. Yeah. But um, sometimes hierarchy is there just so people can stay in their positions versus really solve challenges and get things mm -hmm. done quickly. So I think it's becoming a hybrid. You still might have the hierarchy but people are quicker to turn on a dime and people want to solve something now. You guys are making it feel bad. I, I love the Mountain Dew green bottle. I don't want to change it. it <laughs> I love just, the Mountain Dew bottle. It was an example. <laughs> it was just. You brought it up. I just threw it out there as, you know, uh, hypothetical. I love um, the Dew. Don't get it wrong. So, <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Nicole, you know, a lot of my industry colleagues, and, and I think you might mention this too, but ROA's return on investment when it comes to digital advertising. We're just, you know, been through the roof this year. And we were on a panel together with, you know, Mike Manto, the CEO of Jersey Mike, who I know is a partner of yours as well. I mean, their deliveries, um, and rightfully so, but they used to have about 10% of their revenue was from deliveries. That moved to 90% yep. back in March and April. So talk about just a, a pendulum shift. But I'm just interested to hear about how you feel 2020 has accelerated this direct-to-consumer market, the subscription market, and, and mm -hmm. how you guys are going to kind of fall based on that uh, that new reality. Yeah, I mean, there's there's just this empirical evidence that it's shifted things, right? So we originally had a really, really small percentage of our total business that came from e-com and we had projections out five and 10 years of what those percentages would look like. And overnight, we were at the five-year mark. Mm -hmm. It was so quickly accelerated. So that did a couple of things. Um, first of all, it made it real money, right? Like that's quite a bit of money when you just talk about gross dollars and something we need to pay attention to, something we need to resource against. But it also really made us look at what that consumer experience looks like and how do people buy, particularly in the beverage world, right? Because they're heavy. Yeah. A lot of the stuff we sell tends to be immediate consumption purchase. So it's a different sort of path. What I will say is that 
we absolutely anticipate that online shopping behavior to stick again, no matter what happens with the world, because people who had never engaged in online shopping before suddenly Mm -hmm. did and realized how seamless and simple the experience can be. I think the biggest challenge for CPG companies, especially those at scale like ours, is understanding the value that an aggregator or a pure play um, e-com platform like an Amazon or walmart.com or what have you plays versus a brand or company DTC model. So the aggregator tends to do a better job of meeting consumers' horizontal needs, yep. whether that's you know, a card or whatever the case is, whereas a brand has a really, really amazing opportunity to go deep with that fandom, right? And offer things that you're not going to get on an aggregator site, mm-hmm. whether it's like, you know, a, a, a collaboration with an influencer in a space that's only available for a limited time or custom content that you can only get here or mm-hmm. really cool swag items that get coupled with your product purchase. So I think we we have to, as marketers, really understand the purpose of each channel. And for each yeah. category, that's going to be totally different. And of course, there are lots of companies mm-hmm. now that solely exist in the DTC space. But as that continues to proliferate, there will, I think, inevitably be an expansion and a contraction, as we've seen across so many things um, in, in the virtual space, whether that's music aggregators or you know mm-hmm. content and streaming uh, providers. It gets huge, and then it starts to get smaller. Yeah. But that's probably I mean, over the five. And years. Amazon's a good example. Like They obviously mm-hmm. relied on the UPS and FedExes of the world. They're like, huh, why don't we just deliver our own stuff and create our own delivery system? Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, exactly. you wonder if brands like a, as big as a Pepsi are like, you know, smaller brands need the infrastructure, obviously, mm-hmm. of the um, the warehousing plants and things like that. But if you yeah. have that infrastructure, you can probably even save your customers oh, money yeah. by going direct. It's interesting. Mm-hmm. But Lori, has any of your, I know for me, my purchase behavior has changed big time. I got oh, yeah. subscriptions <laughs> showing up once a week. I don't have to think <laughs> yeah, about it. Totally. But, um, what, what, what's, what's changed for you? What have your clients uh um, yeah, so I, you know, I was just sharing um, that I've just planned an entire wedding for my brother, and I think I had boxes from Amazon coming to my house every single day. Yeah. Uh, there was yeah. a cute meme on Instagram where it said, if a goat showed up in a box, I'd be like, eh, figure out what to do with it. That's kind of how I go. Like, yeah. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I guess I ordered this at some point. (laughs) Right. So I feel like it's really been interesting because I've always had Amazon. I've I've not done online shopping for me personally in terms of clothes, but in terms of household goods and things like that, I would shop every so often on Amazon when I needed something. Mm -hmm. Now it's like an obsession. And I have to say, I think that part of it is necessity and, and, you know, what I want. But the other part of it is that interaction. Like I have something to look forward to. Is that sad to say? Um, I actually. (laughs) So real. So real. (laughs) I like to say, ooh, I just thought of something I wanted. Let me just go online and do it. So now I have this very much online first behavior in terms of when I go shopping, I'm just going to go online first. But what that's done and in contrast for me is sometimes when I'm stuck in the house all day and I'm working all day from a computer and I want to get outside. I force myself to go like to the grocery store instead of using yeah. Instacart because now that's become an experience for me. You know, I, so, uh, my boyfriend said to me, he's like, oh, just order it. And I'm like, no, I'm going to the store because yeah. that's my that's my entertainment for the day, especially in a global pandemic. Yeah. So I think it's interesting because I do think that, you know, behaviors, you know, expand and constrict. And I think that, you know, as we go on things that, you know, we didn't do before, maybe it's a drive-in movie, maybe it's, um, you know, uh, you know, hiking and things like that. People will start to do that in droves. And then as those things start to kind of wear on, people will say, okay, now where's my online, you know, experience. And I feel like the thing that I love the most about what's happening right now is that you can get access to almost anything you need at your fingertips. And I think we knew that, but we didn't go for it as much as we go for it now. So now we have the behavior. Now we know, and now to your point, Nicole, people are going to demand more. What else can I get? What else is there? You know, who else can I get access to? So I think it's an interesting world because nobody knows the answers and yet everybody's sitting there waiting for somebody to, you know, crack that. I think you just explained the plot of the social dilemma in a a weird way. Um, (laughs) That's a scary (laughs) documentary. but yeah, and, and just, I think just wait until you can say, oh, I need a, a new dress or a new shirt for going out tonight. It's two o'clock and it shows up at your yeah. door in 30 minutes. Yeah. Like right. once that time. You can buy a car online. If, if, you like, if oh, I yeah. feel like an ice cold Mountain Dew and it can come to my you know, yeah. doorstep in 10, 15 minutes, that's, that's going to be the future where I think that really changes. Do yeah. I really get in my car and drive at the grocery store or can I just get it? Right. Yep. Yeah, right. Your opportunity I, costs become interesting, right? I mean, even before yeah. it was the cost of like, okay, I can either order this online now and it'll be here in two days. 
looking at my schedule within the next two days, mm -hmm. am I going to have an opportunity to actually physically go to that store and get it? Seriously, right, right. not. So it's still yep. faster. Yeah. Yeah. That is my exact thought process. Yes. I'm buying. <laughs> um, Laura, I want to get your thoughts because again, another uh, with, with social injustice, you and I have talked a lot about the pull up or shut up uh, yes. movement a ton, which really affected the beauty industry. Those of you who don't know, essentially it was a movement that targeted the beauty industry, asking brands to share their diversity numbers uh, with their leadership and their employees, particularly brands that are benefiting off of black culture. And I wanted to just ask you, and I, I know you, you give a lot of talks to companies and you really are consulting on this topic almost daily, but what what do you what role do you think companies or brands have with important topics like this, social injustice, equality? Um, how do you kind of attack those those uh, questions? Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, I'm 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 glad we're in the space we are in now, where it's become a topic of daily conversation, and you have a lot of major brands that are very interested in learning more, educating themselves more, figuring out how they can be part of the solution. Um, you know, but I wish these conversations like everybody had happened sooner and without so much tragedy involved. Yeah. Right. Um, I think that one thing is that, you know, thanks to digital social media, people have a voice and they have real reach with issues like these and the pull up or shut up um, challenge was created by a black woman who owns a beauty company. She created an, uh, her own beauty company and she said, you know, for beauty uh, retailers, we want you to, um, you know, basically put your numbers up, show us your numbers. Who are the brands you carry? How many are black owned? Who are your employees that are running those brands, et cetera? Um, there's also the 15% pledge. Um, actually, I think I got that wrong. The 15% pledge was started by a woman who has a um, beauty company. And she said, you know, 15% of your business or the vendors that you carry need to be black owned. If you have 100% of your business, all we're asking is for 15%. I think that number was created because uh, African-Americans make up almost 15% of the U.S. population. Um, but it was a, a, a great way to say, what are you doing right now? Sephora took the challenge. I think Sephora had a very, very small percentage of um, uh, vendors in their company that were black owned. And then they promised and committed to having 15% of their retail shelf space dedicated to black owned uh, beauty products and companies. And I think that's huge. Um, so I think that the big thing is, is that companies really do need to evaluate where they are. How many black owned vendors do you have? How many multicultural vendors do you have? You know, and break it down, make it as exact science. Um, you know, for big companies and companies that have scale, you already are looking at numbers on a daily basis as it relates to your business. Yeah. And these should be some of those numbers that you also use to evaluate your business because we can only grow and, and become better with more diversity. Um, and the challenge is, is that part of um, equality and equity is also economic equality and equity. Uh, equity. Um, and so that's one of the things that I think people don't really think about as much. Are you giving people of different backgrounds the same opportunity to compete for dollars? Are you giving them a sh shot to compete for your agency dollars or for your, um, you know, vendor dollars, you know, supplier diversity dollars, etc. cetera? Um, I'm on the, uh, on an external council with Nielsen, and they have a commitment to um, different ethnic groups. And we all have different councils based on that. So I'm on the African-American ex uh, External Advisory Council. And we say, hey, we think you need to have this percentage of black vendors as a part of your supplier diversity efforts. So I would, I would encourage companies to not be fearful, not be scared, um, and really just dig into the numbers and set real goals. You know, not, you know, for performative measures, not because you want to, you know, jump in, but really because it's business imperative. The whole world is multicultural yeah. and it's only going to become yeah. more so in the future. So how can we how can we get at that? And anything that has an invoice is an opportunity to use a black owned company or, or a minority owned company. Yeah. That's the way I look at it. Hey, it's David, I know too. you're the host. Can I ask Gloria a question? Of course. Yeah. <laughs> I would just love your perspective on this because sure. um, it, it sounds like this in the way you're talking. Do you feel like with this sort of the the new levels of engagement and exposure that this conversation around racial injustice has at this moment, that it's become a, a safer space for companies just to be transparent about where they are now, as long as they're making a commitment to the journey? I absolutely do. And I worry that they still don't feel safe. 
Um, and okay. I feel that way because when you think about the pull up or shut up challenge, um, only a handful of companies have participated in it. I mean, some major ones, huge ones, but I think there's still this fear of if my numbers look bad, I'm going to be canceled. So the cancel culture has yeah. become a fear driven yeah. culture. And I don't think companies need to worry about being canceled. You're Starbucks, you're Mountain Dew, you're this, you're that. You are not going to be canceled on the whole if you're being transparent and honest and vulnerable saying, Here's where we are, but we have a long way to go. We want to do this in partnership with our communities, in partnership with our customers and consumers. And mm -hmm. I think that's what we're looking for in terms of, you know, people who are really tied to the space in terms of trying to drive change forward. Just be honest, transparent, and vulnerable. And I think people will rally around, your customers will rally around and help you get there. Um, so mm -hmm. I don't want companies to be fearful, but I do think it is a safe space. And every time I speak with companies, I tell all of their employees, you know, that as a first thing. This is a safe space. Ask any question. Mm -hmm. You know, tell me your fears. Tell me what 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 you're thinking. How can we overcome this together? And I think the right answer for brands, right, is like a brand should be a combination of, you know, your um, your internal your internal people, your employees for that work for that brand, and also your consumer as well. And how do we? Because I, I think for me, like for for ST and digital, you know my staff cares so much about equality and, and all these different things that it would be so disingenuous for me, A, not to bring it up or B, not to have some type of stance on it, like when it comes to our social and things like that. Mm -hmm. But Nicole, I don't know, I, I feel, and I'd love to get your take on it, especially with millennial and Gen Z and, mm -hmm. and, and as, as, these, as these different groups, you know, kind of continue to raise up, uh, I just feel like brands are going to have to, um, I guess the millennial and Gen Z, you know, people are going to want to know how, where brands fall in some of these major mm -hmm. issues. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right on. I also think fundamentally any brand or business that either benefits from or helps to create culture has an, a, a mandate to be part of the progress, right? So the, we're in this interesting space in the world right now where um, brands and business tend to be on the forefront of progress that is being pushed by the population, right? Mm -hmm. And in a lot of ways, we're doing the same work that, um, you know, has been done by legislation in the past, but it's yeah. being done by culture and being codified yes. by brand and business today. Mm -hmm. And I think that is, it, it's, it's, um, it's a significant responsibility, I guess, is the mm -hmm. way uh, I think about it. And, you know, I think I love what you had to say, Lori, about like not being afraid to just be vulnerable yeah. and and talk about that journey, be transparent, be honest about the, the path and about your commitment to it. Um, you know, for a brand like Mountain Dew, it's important that we understand where do we have an opportunity to actually make a change? Where do we have mm -hmm. an opportunity to, to invest in progress? Um, and for us, that was really with uh, HBCUs and helping to support black entrepreneurialism mm -hmm. in an effort to close the wealth gap. That's mm -hmm. where we have historically invested. That's right. where, yeah, I mean, it, and it's been such an incredible journey, right. both with our internal employees in talking about the investments we want to make and how to ensure those are having the greatest impact they can, they can That's working right. with the alumni groups within the organization to reach out to, uh, to their schools and see where we can add value. We're doing mm -hmm. this awesome Shark Tank like event in January with entrepreneurs who are either mm -hmm. recent grads from HBCUs or uh, currently enrolled. So, yeah, I mean, I'm kind of sort of talking around here, but like I said, I think, I think brands have a moral imperative to be a part of it finding where it makes sense for you to dock in and actually make real yes. change is, is an important step. And I think especially- yeah, Can I say Lori, one thing, David? Yeah, of course. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. Well, I just wanted to say, I think that's really great that uh, Mountain Dew is doing that. And I will also say that, um, you know, a lot of people have uh, approached saying, oh, can we do something with HBCUs? Can we do this? Can we do that? I think that is phenomenal. And I, and I applaud you guys for doing that. And I would say, keep going um, because there are also black students at other institutions that also need help. But one thing I wanna encourage people to do as well is to look at your core teams um, because we find that in the hiring practices, people tend to hire those who remind them of themselves. Mm -hmm. And I've been guilty of it. I, when I heard that, I was like, oh, wow. When I see a spark in someone, and it reminds me of how I felt back then, I do feel a kindred connection and I want to employ them. Yeah. Oftentimes that person is the same race, might be the same sex, whatever. And so then you start to have teams that tend to look very similar and homogenous instead of you know, diverse teams. So mm -hmm. I would encourage people too, to look at the folks you know, around the round table in any meeting uh, on your specific team or even above you and say, are we representing you know, the, the world's population, even our customer population, are we representing that internally? 
Um, it's not enough to have one black person, one Indian person, one this, because oftentimes that one person has worked like hell to try to break these ceilings. And they're like, they're, they're the, they're not the outlier, but they're the superstar, right? But there are a lot of people who can become that if they're given an opportunity. And so um, I love that you guys are already doing things with HBCUs because I think you're recruiting that talent pool at a young age. Um, but I would encourage everybody else who's listening, who might be wondering, what, where can I start? What can I do? You can start as easily as looking at your own teams and looking at who you're hiring yourself specifically and try to build that out. And I think yeah. having those open conversations with your partners is important too. Yes. Your partners, your mm-hmm. vendor partners. Oh, and again, we not in a punitive it. way. Right. Yeah. Yes. Right. Well, no, I ask people that we hire. I'm sorry, David. I ask people that we hire. I had to say to someone. Uh, I, I, I can leave. I don't know. <laughs> We're good. We're good. Nicole and I are going to talk later. We're good. We're good. Uh, But no, I had to ask a a vendor who had a beautiful staff page, but they were all white women, all dressed the same, et cetera. I said, you know, do you have any people of color? Do you have any black people on your team? We're in New Orleans. We're going to hire you in New Orleans. Do you have any black people on your team? we're trying to promote you at, you know, work with you at the Essence Music Festival, which attracts half a million Black women. Um, and it was something that I actually struggle with asking for a hot second because I didn't want them to think that it was so racially motivated that it wasn't about or what or their or it was work. personal. It's not personal. Right, yeah. right. They had great work. Their work was phenomenal, but yeah. it gave me pause because there was no diversity, which means that it wasn't a priority. And I think that's what bothered me. So I start to ask vendors, like even behind the cameras when we do shoots, I'm like, do you have a diverse squad? Because we are not going to work with a company if it's all homogenous. We want diversity yeah. behind the camera. And um, yeah, and I think as far as a digital consumer, this goes back to marketing overall. Um, it's a lot easier, I think, for choice, right? It's not so much walking down the aisle and whatever's the brightest, like most, uh, you know, largest brand. It's not so much about if the if the makeup is the best or it tastes the best, but I feel like in this new era, like what are your ethos? What's your mission? What are your values? Like as a brand, and it just starting to matter more. I don't, I don't think it mattered 25 years ago as much. I don't think it definitely didn't matter 50 years ago. Just like you know, you, you stop into a store and you grab whatever you want. But it seems like for markers, that's going to be an important thing to yes. to know what your mission, ethos, yep. values are. But don't think uh, that you overall. have to sacrifice quality when you say I want to have a diverse team. Um, right. That was a point no. that someone mentioned to me. Like, oh well, they don't have to be the best. Just you know give them a shot. And I understand what she meant. Her intent Mm -hmm. was don't have such a standard that you want someone, let's say, for example, like my agency just launched this year. Mm -hmm. If a a company wants to see this, you know, 15 year work history of all these great things that we've done, you're not going to see that because we just launched in in February, but we can do the work. We just need the chance. So I think what she was trying to say is give people a chance. If you believe in them, if you feel like they have the skill set, but don't think you have to sacrifice quality when you say, Mm -hmm. oh, I'm going to hire some someone from a diverse background or a black person or a minority person, even if they're not so great, that shouldn't be the intent because oftentimes minorities have to be even greater to even get, you know, a look. So don't think that there's a trade-off there. But with this call for transparency and with so much information availability through the digital world, people are, I think, even more motivated to vote with their dollars, whether that's the companies they hire individually to like come and Mm -hmm. do, you know, a kitchen renovation, whatever the case is, right? right? Down to the big brands that they're going to buy when they're Mm -hmm. shopping in the grocery store or buying clothes online or whatever the case is, you can find out about the sustainability practices and about the racial diversity within the company. Do they have commitments uh, to make progress on those fronts? Where have they donated dollars from a political standpoint? Like all of that information is available. And Mm -hmm. the informed consumer, I think from a marketing perspective, can be our biggest ally because they are making those choices based on the decisions and the positions and the point of view that brands and companies have. Mm -hmm. And that's, that, that to me spells like worthwhile to think. So it matters even more. It matters so much. And yeah, even if people are going to be selfish from a business perspective alone, like it's a super important thing. (laughs) You know what I mean? Like if that's all you want to, yeah. So it's an yeah. important topic to, to understand yeah. and, and I think dig into for any corporation, any brand. Yeah, All right, absolutely. so we are um, almost out of time. I want to end, as you as you know, Lori, about me. Let's say that on a positive note. Let's make sure we're always you know, leaving this with some good yes. energy. Um, yes. What are you most excited about? I mean, so much has changed over the last you know nine months or so. We really 
hit this reset button on society and marketing. I think the digital revolution, um, as mm. Nicole pointed out, some of those numbers you thought were going to happen in five years happened in one month. So yes. all of a sudden, this digital revolution has been fast forwarded. But for marketers, I'll start with you, Lori. What uh, what excites mm. you? Um, you know, as we sit here today and as we go forward to twenty twenty one and beyond. I will say there are two things that excite me most. One is innovation. I love innovation. I feel like we are forced to innovate even more so uh, these days. And I just can't wait to see what it turns out. I can't wait to see what the next TikTok is. I can't wait to see what the next Netflix becomes. You know, I cannot wait for these young superstars, these Gen, these Gen Zers to come out with something phenomenal that blows our mind and we never would have thought of you, it. You mean that new band Fleetwood Mac? They're really good. I heard they just <laughs> came out with a new song. Right, Paul McCartney, <laughs> that new guy that Kanye yeah. discovered. Yeah. Great new artist. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm also very excited about progress. And I just have to applaud you, David, because David is one of um, the most inspiring leaders I know. And, and as soon as Black Lives Matter happened, he took to creating a new kind of um, mantra and, and his commitment to diversity internally. And he actually talked with me about it and talked to somebody else about it. And I thought that was such a huge thing. It wasn't for show. He didn't have to go broadcast it. It was important to him and it's important to his team. And I can't wait to see more leaders take that initiative quickly and proactively. And there's so many out there that are doing it. And I hope they inspire others by being public with their efforts, because I think that's the way that we all create, you know, progress and momentum for the future. Ah, that is beautiful. That's awesome. <laughs> Um, I'm, I'm, I share your excitement for progress. It finally yeah. feels like we are at a true tipping point as a society to solve yes. some of the major fundamental challenges that we have, um, as a country, as a people, uh, to get closer to each other, to find mm -hmm. that empathy. And I, again, I, I really think that this collective experience of going through this pandemic together has, opened an empathetic part of lots of people's hearts that maybe had not been cracked before. And that's because we are, no matter who you are, no matter where you live, no matter how much money you make, no matter who you love, none of that matters when it comes to going through this kind of thing together. And I know, you know, different, uh, different people are going through it in different ways, but it is a collective experience and that, that um, ability to see your brothers and sisters in the world with, I think, new and empathetic eyes has mm -hmm. opened the possibility of real change for us. And that's, that's super duper exciting. Really, yeah. really is from a fundamental human perspective. And, you know, as marketers, of course, I think yeah. what that means is opening the door for even more intimate relationships with our yes. fans. Yeah. And I think um, for me as well, I really, on, on the the tech and innovation side, like Lori mentioned, obviously being a social first company, I've been screaming from the mountaintops for the last eight years, like, this is important, I promise. Um, mm -hmm. But now every brand is like, we have to have a social first strategy, we have to have an e-commerce strategy, we have to have a direct to consumer yeah. strategy. Yes. And if they if they weren't woke up before, they got they got woke up, uh, you know, in mid-March of like, yeah. It's like, don't wait next time. Don't wait, tell yeah, you. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and then to what you guys said about equality, it's like, I, I saw a quote recently. It's like, if you're ever wondering if you're on the wrong side of history or right side of history, if it has anything to do with someone having less human rights, then you're on the wrong side of history. That's usually how right. it works. So I, mm -hmm. I, I agree with both of you. It's, it's exciting where we're going in terms of um, this tech and innovation, but also so exciting. I think we're, we're coming together more as a, as a people, or at least talking yes. about these things that are so important for that. Mm -hmm. So with that, uh, it was a pleasure. It's just like we're you know yes. hanging out, chatting, no big deal. Um, yeah. Of course, Nicole Partwood from uh, Mountain Dew PepsiCo and Lori Hall from Poppin Creative. Thank you so much for joining us. Yes, appreciate it. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Thanks, hashtag. Appreciate it. <laughs> thank Bye. you, hashtag.